start to say good morning, but it's not. Good evening. I want to remind you Sunday morning at homecoming, the Freedom Quartet will be here. Uh, encourage all of you that the ones that can park on the grass, park on the grass, I'm looking for 200, 300. Man, you're going to have faith. You've got to believe. I promise you, if you'll beat the bushes as hard as I'll beat the bushes, we'll stand them to kill. What do you think? Amen. Amen. I believe. I believe. I believe it. Miss Barbara is doing fine. I think I got her under control. Almost. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> like a big boy when he was little growing up, he'd, he'd throw you the ball. I'd say, you just, it was a strike. He'd say, almost. Everything to him was almost. That's the way my life is. I'm almost. <laughs> so once you open your Bible, book of Galatians, third chapter, we'll be starting. We got down to through the 12th verse, but I'm, I'm going to back up to the 10th verse, just touch a few things. And I wish the entire world would be here tonight because this is so, so, so important. The book of Galatians was written by, by the Apostle Paul because there was a problem in the church at Galatia. He had been there. This church had been established that Jesus Christ was the only way into heaven. They had exercised their faith. They believed that Jesus' blood had been shed for their sins. They believed he resurrected for their sins. And they believed that all they had to do is ask on his blessed name and receive him. Believe, have faith, and they were saved. And so that's how the church started. But they had a group of people that came in and said, Now, that's fine what you're doing, but this is what you need to do. If you're going to really be saved, you need to get circumcised. Now, circumcision was a command under the law. Uh, the Philistines back in the Old Testament, they were, they were called the uncircumcised Philistines. But this was a covenant through circumcision and all the Jew babies were circumcised. So when Christ came along, death, burial, resurrection, the church started, all of it was by grace and faith. Then the problem is that. And it's the same problem today. We cannot bring into our belief that you get saved by grace, but you can only stay saved by grace if you do certain things. That's preposterous. And he's going to reveal it to us tonight. Third chapter, I'm going to read the first few verses. Uh, tenth verse. Third chapter, tenth verse. I like to read 10, 11, and 12 and just touch it for a minute. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the books of the law to do them, but that no man is justified by the works, by the law in the sight of God, but it is evident for the just shall live by faith. For the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Now just as plain as the nose on my face. Couldn't be any plainer than that. I want you to notice some things. He says that the law is a curse. Well, if, if something is cursed, that means it's been damned and what it stands for. Now, why would he give, why would God give Moses the law? And then after Jesus death, burial, and resurrection makes its ascension into heaven and the church is started, why in the world would he come back and say that the law is a curse? He says, Cursed is everyone that continues not in all things which are written in the book of the laws to do them. Every commandment that God gave was a curse to man. I want to touch this real quick. We know that man had no knowledge of sin. Everybody sinned up until the commandments was given on Mount Sinai to Moses. But no man until that period of time, sin was not accounted on his account. He was not accountable to it. So God, for the first time, revealed himself in the law of saying, this is what I stand for. 
This is right, this is right, this is right, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. So for the first time, man was able to see the mind of God. It was written down, printed down, chiseled down, handed down. Now he says that it's a curse. And the reason it's a curse is because you got to do it and keep it every day. Now suppose for one minute that in my lifetime, and it's impossible, but so I was able to keep every commandment in this book, which is impossible. And then on my deathbed, a fly would come by and light in my mouth and I'd begin to choke. And while I was choking, I would say, take the Lord's God name in vain. But now swallow the fly and I die. Now under the law, I'd go to hell. Everything that I had done all my life would not matter. Now I'm talking about under the law. I'm not talking about me being saved now. Under the law, that's the way it worked. So no man was able to keep the law. But the law was just to make man accountable for his sins so that he would know what sin was and the things that he did wrong. So God revealed his mind through the law to man and man became accountable for his sins. Uh, 11th verse, but that no man is justified by the law. Justified means as though we have never sinned. It said the law can't do that for you. It is evident that the just shall live by faith. So he's telling the church at Galatia, you, you do not have to be circumcised. You can't go back under the law. You can't do the law because it's grace and faith that saves you. So the just shall live by faith, and the law is not a faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. So we must believe Christ died, buried, resurrected. He did it for us. We must confess to him that we believe that and say, Lord, come into my life and save me because I believe this is what you did for me. It has nothing to do with law. Church in Galatia was trying to get it back under the law again. All right, now we're ready. 13th verse. We're ready to start tonight. Christ hath redeemed <coughs> us. That's a good statement. How, what did Christ redeem us from? The curse of the law. You said, well, I thought that he redeemed us from our sins. Well, what in the world are we thinking about? The law, no man could keep and no man could, could get into heaven by the law. It was a curse because it only brought condemnation to us. And so Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. And here's how he did it. <coughs> Being made a curse for us. He removed us from the damnation of the law. And he be took our damnation upon himself and became damned for us. Now think about it. Someone that never committed a sin. Someone that never was tempted to do evil. He was tested by the devil. There's a difference in test and tempt. He was not even, he never for a moment ever gave complacence in his mind to say, I think I might sin or I think I might do this. Never. But he was willing to bear our, our sin. And our sin came with the knowledge of sin. And that's by the law, and the law was a curse, and he became a curse for us. And here is what it words at. For it is written, Cursed is he, or cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Now, how did that curse, when you think about somebody hanging on a tree, what does that represent to you in your mind? What do you, who would be hanged on a tree? Somebody that needed it. Somebody that was guilty. 
They put thieves there. They put murderers there. They put rapists there. They put all kinds of people there that did sin and did wrong. But what did Jesus ever do? Nothing. Except for one thing, he was willing to be our substitute. Because a sacrifice that God would accept had to be a sacrifice without spot and without blemish. It had to be a perfect sacrifice. And could, there wasn't a man in the world that could qualify to be that kind of sacrifice for so Jesus did. Now, the 13th and 14th verse have, this, have something that go together. In the beginning of the 13th verse, it says Christ had <coughs> redeemed us from the curse. Now, I want you to remember, hath redeemed us. Because in the 14th verse, it says that the blessings of Abraham might come on the uh, Gentiles through Christ Jesus that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through him. And when I read that verse, it didn't, it just, I didn't have any, it didn't bite or any grip to me. I didn't have understanding of it. But if you read it like this, he redeemed us in order that the blessings of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Christ Jesus that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through Him. So the 14th verse, if you, if you just insert the beginning of the 13th verse, it makes the 14th verse complete because that's what he's talking about. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, 14th verse. He redeemed us uh, in order to, uh, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. All right? There are, I think, four things here. Number one is the blessing of Abraham. Number two is Gentiles. Number three is Jesus Christ. And number four is promise. And number five is Spirit. Now, we know that he's going to make a, a comparison. I guess the way you put it. Law versus promise. Now, the, what did God promise Abraham that he was going to do for him? All nations would be blessed through him. All right. He'd become the father of them. All nations would be blessed through him. Now, that is called a promise. In order to, if I promise you something, you either believe it or you don't believe it. Abraham believed God, and it was what we did this last week. And it was put on his credit account for righteousness because he believed. He believed God. So he's telling us that the law was a curse. We can't be saved by the law. Christ had given himself to redeem us or from the curse of the law. And that we because Jesus has done that, that we might have the blessing of Abraham come on the Gentiles. Now, the Jewish line comes down through Abraham. But we Gentiles in the Old Testament were called dogs. We were on the outside looking in. Didn't have a chance. So God, through Abraham, made a promise that he could become, he would become the father of a great nation and through them that the Gentiles would be blessed. But he says the blessing through Abraham come to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. So we're going to be brought in to the family of God by Jesus, but Jesus was a promise that God gave to Abraham. He said, well, I'll believe that you will when we get down to it that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now, when we get saved, we believe Jesus is the Son of God, that He shed His blood, He buried, resurrected for us. We ask Him to save us. Immediately, when we believe, we exercise our faith, He saves us. Then what happens? Spirit comes in. Immediately, immediately when you ask, when you receive Christ, God comes right then. The Spirit, that's the promise that God made 
Abraham. That's a promise that he made unto the Jews, to the Gentiles, and that's how we got into the family of God. But he said he made this promise that we receive the promise of the Spirit through what? Faith. Faith. So he's, Paul is trying to show the, the church in Galatia, you're working and the law has nothing to do with your position in Christ. Has nothing to do with it. I have a good friend, and he. We finally had to quit talking about religion. We agreed to disagree. He believes with all his heart that you have got to be baptized to be saved, and if you don't get baptized, you're not going to be saved. And I asked him, I said, Ray, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Yes, I do. Do you believe he died for you? Yes, I do. Do you believe you can do anything to earn eternal life besides Jesus Christ? No, I don't. I said, well, you're saved. He said, yes, I'm saved. I said, what saved you? Baptism. And this, this, gone, this went on for about 10 or 15 years. We'd have these discussions regular. And I finally told him one day, I said, well, we're not going to talk about this anymore. We'll talk about fishing, whatever you want to talk about. But you've got you a shot coming, big boy. I said, I'm saved, and I've been baptized, but I know baptism didn't save me. You're saved, and you're thinking that getting drugged through that water got you saved. But you wait until you go stand in the presence of God and you're going to find out that that water does nothing to do except get you wet. That's all. So I found that if a person gets, their, gets indoctrinated in another way, it's hard to break them away from it. Yeah. And so this church in Galatia was started on a firm foundation. But boy, the infiltrators that came in with Judaism of saying, yeah, but we're more spiritual than you. We, we stand a little higher in God than you because we've been circumcised. We're more spiritual. We've been circumcised. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> I'm not going to go any further with it. <laughs> and for years as a young Christian, I used to think, Man, I want to be as spiritual as they are. Uh, I watch some of the. Uh, I'm gonna have to quit. I'm gonna have to go to sleep and quit watching <laughs> that religious thing. They sang one song last night for 30 minutes, <laughs> as in a tent meeting, and I the good sing. And I watch, and man, here comes somebody. And then here one come on, and I and I just kept watching. And then finally one came out, and I don't know what he said. I stood in amazement. I've been to a lot of different foreign countries, but I never heard anything like that. And then boy picked up again and died down. Here he went again. What makes you spiritual is what lives inside you. All these outward ornaments that people try to hang on to try to say, if you can do this or if you can do this, then you are higher than everybody else. That is baloney, folks. That's legalism. That's all he's trying to do at Galatia. We are a country people here. You might think you was raised in Barlow or Wycliffe and you're uptown, but you're country. And we are a people that believe grace plus nothing, minus nothing. We are a people that believe that Jesus did it all. And we have absolutely nothing to do with it. And we're only permitted in the presence of God by, on the merits of Jesus Christ. That's it. If we could do something for it, we'd make a mess out of it before we ever got it. That's right. If you don't believe that, read the Old Testament. <laughs> Lord, them cats, they made a mess of it every time they turned around. Good Lord willing, I'm going to preach about 
seven or eight books Sunday morning on Solomon. He's a character, you know. 900 wives and 300 cat concubines. And my close. Something wrong with that cat's thinking. <coughs> Smartest man in, in the world. And pull the dumbest stunt that's ever been pulled. So we can't do, we can't earn. It's a gift, it's a gift, it's a gift, it's a gift. And I'm so glad it's a gift because I got I had the opportunity to witness to a man Tuesday about the blood of Jesus and what he does. He, he was wanting to get right, but he was wanting to do something to get right. And he had been taught by his parents you had to live a certain way. And I said, oh, partner, I, I did that for years. And it don't work. It'll never get you done. It's going to be on the merits of Christ plus nothing minus nothing. Fifteen. <laughs> Brothering, I speak after the manner, manner of men. Now, when he says that, he said, now, we're going, this is, what I'm going to say to you now is not in the Bible. He said, I'm going to talk to you like we were standing outside, sitting on the bench. And I'm going to take something that you know and I know, and we're going to, I'm going to explain something spiritual to you that you can understand by the physical thing. Brother, and I speak after the manner of men. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man nullifieth or addeth thereunto. Now this is all he's saying. Have you done business with a bank in your lifetime? Yep. yep. Go down and say, all right, I want to borrow $10,000. How long would you like that? Well, I would like to keep my payments low. Okay? We can fix you up. Let's set it up for 10 years. And this is the amount of interest that you're going to pay. And your promise, when you sign this piece of paper, you will pay this amount every month on the money that I'm giving you, and it's going to take 10 years for you to pay this amount of money back with interest. You say, it sounds like a good deal to me. So the bank note, they write it out, and you sign it. You have signed your life away. That's what Paul said. When you make a covenant, that's a transaction. When you make a covenant with a person, when you sign that covenant, I mean, you're bound. That man cannot go and take that and say, well, interest has gone up. Now, if it wasn't designated in there where the interest would rise or fall, if it gives a percentage and it's stuck there, that's the amount... Whether that guy likes it or not, if you're paying 3% or 4% and then the interest goes up to 25%, he's stuck. He can't do anything about it. And in the midst of it, you're saying, you know, my payment is a little bit too high. I don't have, hardly have enough. I want you to change that payment for me. You're stuck. That's all Paul's saying. Contract, covenant. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, signed, sealed, delivered, that's confirmation, no man denullify or add a third to You can't take away from it. You can't add to it. You can't destroy it. It's there and it's always going to be there. Now he's going to tell you, get spiritual now. He used something physical, now he's going to show us a spiritual application. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Now underline the word seed in your Bible. 
Seed is as how many fingers have I got? One. One. That's a singular word. Seed. One. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not and to seeds, plural, underline that, as of many. So we've got two words, singular and plural. The promise that he gave Abraham was a single promise, seed, one, 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 one seed. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one and to thy seed which is Christ. Boy, this is good stuff. I don't know whether I can explain it like it needs to be or not. God chose Abraham to become father of a great nation. He said, I will make you the father of a great nation. And to thy seed. seed. All right, Abraham had Isaac. Isaac had Jacob. Jacob became the father of 12 sons. They became the 12 tribes of Israel. Then comes along that Judah is from where David, King David, the line of King David, and from King David comes all the way down to Jesus. Now here's this single seed. First of all, he chose Abraham, and all of the Jews were Jews. But he was pointing way down the road to one seed, and that's Jesus. That's the promise that he made. You say, well, we're not Jews. He said he had to redeem us Gentiles. He had to get us in his program somehow. And so his, the blessing that he blessed Abraham with, he also was going to bless us with, but that blessing would come through one person, one seed, through the Jewish line, and it would end up down in Bethlehem of Judea in a virgin's womb called Mary, planted there by the Holy Spirit of God. And when he was born, he was called Jesus. Right. Man. Now that excites me. Because now I'm starting in my mind to say, hey, I'm getting a hold of this thing. I'm starting to get a picture of what God was trying to do all along. From the time of the expulsion that he took uh, Adam and Eve out of the garden, they sinned and sinned and sinned and sinned and sinned. Then on Mount Sinai, God gave the law, and man became accountable to the law, but it became a curse to him. But then there was Abraham and the promise of Jesus that something was going to happen that was going to come. 17th verse. I want to do two more verses real quick. And this I say that, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ. The law, which was 430 years after, cannot nullify that it should make the promise of none effect. 430 years before Moses went up on Mount Sinai to get the commandments of God, the law, God made his promise 430 years before time. The law came 430 years after the promise, but it took a long time down the road before the promise came. Now you remember we talked about the covenant, we talked about the banknote and the payment. You can't get out of it. Both parties are stuck in the middle of it. He made a promise. The law doesn't nullify that promise. The law brought knowledge of sin to man. 18th verse. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. So all the law is, for us to know what 
right and what's wrong, but it can't save us. If the law could have saved us, it wouldn't have been in need for Jesus to ever come. Right. If the law could have saved us, Jesus would never have to have been stripped naked, nailed to a cross, spear thrust into his side, buried in a borrowed tomb, resurrected and make his ascension into heaven. Been no need of it. But see, he had to get us heathens in there somewhere. He had to make a place for us. And I'm so glad that he did. Glad you came tonight. If you men will stick around for a minute, we need to uh, move some chairs in the back. Everyone wants to, uh, where she can. Wax. Wax. Yeah. That's about it. Uh, we need to do that, and we need to move the uh, <coughs> chairs at the back of the wall. We will not be having a baptizing Sunday. I, I got excited Sunday morning. Forgot about homecoming. <laughs> you know, it's always good when somebody gets saved. Isn't it? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. I've heard some several say, when Heather came and said, I wonder what she's doing up there. <laughs> Folks, don't ever question. Right. We never know. And I've had this experience in my life thinking, <clears throat> well, I thought they was a Christian all along. That's like me going in the garage and going, boom, boom, boom. I'll tell you I'm a car. <laughs> it has nothing to do with it. So if you men stick around, we'll do this. Let's stand and be